Can everybody hear me? Good. My dad was an actor, and he taught me to project. And he used to say, everyone who teaches should have theater skills. So hopefully, mine will work. So I want to do three things today. The first is that I want to talk about what torture really is, not the rhinestone-studded version that we see on TV shows like 24 or in movies like Zero Dark Thirty, but what torture really is like. Then I want to talk a little bit about why I think classical ethical arguments, the usual arguments both in favor of torture and against torture, miss the mark. So let me ask you this. How many people here have ever taken an ethics course? Oh, not bad. So who can tell me the first formulation of the, no, it's OK. <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then finally, what I'd like to finish up with, and I haven't even told Sam this, is that I want to talk a little bit about the connection in the US history of involvement in torture between race and torture. Because we cannot talk about the United States' use of torture without talking about how race functions in this country. And so we'll get to that in the third part. So that's a lot to do. And I'm going to try to talk for no more than 45 minutes. And when I get done with that, plenty of time for Q&A if people have questions. OK, so what is torture? What I'm talking about is a particular kind of torture that I call institutionalized state torture. So this is not Jack Bauer saving Los Angeles from a ticking time bomb. It's not some brave individual who is going to torture one person to save 100,000 in a city. What I'm going to argue is that we have to stop thinking of torture this way, because that's not what happens. Instead, torture is not something lonely individuals do in moments of extremity. Rather, it is a socially embedded, institutionalized practice. I'm going to lay out a little bit later what I mean by that. But it's not something you, as one of my students once said, you can't just torture somebody on a whim. It's something that actually has its own rituals of initiation. It has its own traditions. It has its own internal set of values that are carried on and are passed on to new people who are brought into the practice. And this all exists in the context of the larger society that gives it a home. So let me give you my definition of institutionalized state torture. It is the intentional infliction of severe mental or physical suffering by an official or agent of some political entity, which results in dismantling the victim's sensory, psychological, and social worlds with the purpose of establishing or maintaining that political entity's power. So you notice I didn't say anything about information. So we'll come back to that. But let's unpack it a little bit. So the first part, the intentional infliction of severe mental or physical suffering by an official or agent of a government comes from the UN Convention Against Torture and Other in Cruel, Inhuman, and Degrading Acts, which was signed by the United States when Bill Clinton was president and was ratified by the United States. Because that, that treaty was signed and ratified by the Senate, it is actually now part of the supreme law of the land. And that's because the US Constitution, in its sixth article, says, any treaty that is signed by the president and ratified by the Senate becomes the supreme law of the land. So that means that we are duty bound by having ratified that treaty to obey what it contains. One of the provisions in the treaty was that the country should pass its own local legislation to put the treaty in fo into force in this country. The US did that. And it's actually criminal code number 2441. And what it essentially does is make torture illegal outside the United States. Now, you might wonder, why outside the United States? The argument was that we already have laws against 
assault and battery and those things here in the United States. And so we have, you know, the Fifth Amendment that prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. And so therefore, torture is already illegal in the U.S. We don't need to make it a separate crime. The convention says very clearly it has to be a separate crime. And the convention also says that people who are guilty of that crime must be prosecuted. And it also says people who are victims of that crime must have the right to go to court and get reparations. Successive administrations, the Bush administration and the Obama administration, have blocked those attempts over and over and over again. OK, so we have this law that makes torture illegal if it happens outside the US. And it, um, like any law, requires interpretation. So there is this clause about severe mental or physical suffering. So how on earth can we interpret such a complicated and difficult issue as what is severe mental and physical suffering? You may think it's obvious, but it was not obvious to the CIA, and it was not obvious to the administration of, the Bu of Bush because they went to the Office of Legal Counsel for the president, and they asked two guys, two lawyers there, John Yu and Jay Bybee, to interpret this incredibly complex and incomprehensible language. And they came back and said, well, to count as severe physical suffering, the pain involved would have to be so great that it would be equivalent to what we would usually associate with organ failure or even death. In other words, you didn't kill him, you didn't torture him. And then there's the question of what is mental suffering. And there they said, well, you know, the problem with mental suffering is we don't know if it's going to last or not. So really, in order to count as torture, the effects of that suffering would have to last for years or even decades. Well, you can see a little bit of problem for a time-bound creature who lives, you know, one moment at a time. How are you going to be able to know or predict what the effects a, a year or a decade from now are going to be of what you're doing to someone now? It's an impossible standard. Nonetheless, it's a standard that was then incorporated into further law, which um, protects members of, uh, of any administration from prosecution as long as they have a reasonable uh, belief that what they are doing is not in violation of the torture statute. And one of, the, one of the legitimate reasons is reliance on the opinion of counsel. In other words, if John Yu and Jay Bybee told you it's not torture, then in the eyes of the law, it's not torture. You might want to know where John you and Jay Bybee are today. Mm -hmm. Jay Bybee is now a federal judge. And John Yu has an endowed chair at the University of California at Berkeley Law School. So um, they have not suffered as a result of what some people have felt was a perversion of the, of the legal mind, if not their legal expertise. OK. So I said that torture results in dismantling the victim's sensory, psychological, and social worlds. What do I mean by that? There's a philosopher some of you may have heard of named Elaine Scarry, who has written about this. And she's given a description of torture as the unmaking of a person's world. And she says, to begin with, the experience of, of torture robs you of your ability to speak. So who here has ever had really profound physical pain? It doesn't have to be from torture, but has ever experienced really terrible pain. So you know then that in that moment, you can't talk. All you can do if you make noises is scream or grunt. And the thing is that human beings interact with the world linguistically. Even when we are not speaking to each other, unless you're a master meditator, there is almost always in your mind an internal dialogue. And you are constantly using language to interpret the world to yourself. And so when you lose the capacity for language, even temporarily, you're losing touch with yourself. You are losing touch with your cognitive reality. In the same way, the pain of torture shrinks 
the person's world down to, as a theologian named William Cavanaugh puts it, down to the contours of the person's own body. There is no world outside your own body. In the same way, you also lose contact with your sense of time. And so Kavanaugh, writing about torture under the Pinochet regime in Chile, says, you know, he, he quotes a woman, a British woman, a doctor, who was um, arrested under Pinochet and tortured. And she said, it was as though I were suspended over a pit and the past had no meaning and there was no future. So your world now has shrunk down spatially to the contours of your body, temporally to this eternal moment of now. Psychologically, you are cut off from your own personhood in a very real way. And then there's the social destruction. So the social destruction happens like this. You know, people talk about torture being to get information. And the reality is, and I'm happy to talk about more of this more in the Q&A, but the truth is that torture is a really bad way to get information. Because what you get is a whole wax ball of confabulation. Some of it might be true. Some of it might be false. Some of it might be things the person thinks are true but aren't because they don't know any better. They don't actually have the information. And a lot of it, most of it, is whatever it is they think the person torturing them wants to hear. And so one of the things that very often happens in people who've been tortured in torture regimes like um, those in Latin America in the eight, 70s and 80s will say, you know, at some point they gave up a name or the address of a safe house or some other single piece of information. And what the torturers would always say is, we already knew that, but we wanted to hear you say it. So why? Because now what you've done is you have taken a person and you have caused that person to betray whoever it is that is closest to them in the world, whatever it is that they care most about. And not only that, but you take that person who's been tortured and then you turn them loose on the street and they go back to their organization and everyone in the organization is now suspicious because you don't know who did she betray? Who did she give up? What did she say? And that suspicion sort of swims like a fish through the whole organization and pulls it apart from the inside out. And I, some of you may be old enough to have remembered the days of COINTELPRO, which was the FBI's um, program to destabilize the Black Panthers and other, um, other groups that were on loosely on the left, the anti-Vietnam War movement. And we used to talk all the time about, is there an agent here? You know, is there somebody here? And the thing was that the suspicion that was built into that question was so much more destructive to the organization than anything an agent could actually have reported about us. It was that suspicion that tore us apart and in some cases made people kill each other. And so this is, this is the purpose, in effect, of torture. Another way of saying it is it's a way of attacking social bodies, organized potential sites of resistance like labor unions, sewing cooperatives, Christian-based communities, or, you know, the insurgency against the U.S. presence in Iraq, which I'm not saying I hold a brief for one way or the other, but an, or any kind of organized resistance to the regime, you can tear apart through torture, but only works if people know it's happening, which is why some people are released. So in a similar sense, the U.S. torture that's been carried on in the war on terror works in a double way. In the places where we did it, in Afghanistan, the people that we picked up in Pakistan or Yemen or wherever, or um, uh, Montenegro or wherever we actually you know, picked people up in Europe and took them to various dark sites and tortured them, the purpose there is to serve as the warning, this is what will happen to you if you resist the power of the United States. But for those of us who live in the United States, there were some other messages 
that were conveyed by this torture. So one message is our government is a good government. We are leaders around the world in the field of human rights. If our government, this good government, is forced to do such terrible things, and we knew that that was true because all you had to do was read the daily newspaper. It's not like it was a secret. As early as 2002, you could read in the Washington Post about torture that was going on at Bagram Air Force Base in, in Afghanistan, if you wanted to know. So the, the argument is, if our good government is forced to do such terrible things, think how terrible the people must be that we have to do this to. And furthermore, think how terrible the danger must be that you, American, are living in. And so, in fact, the fact that the US was working what Dick Cheney called the dark side, that you know, as Kofor Black, who was um, in the NSA, went up, he was the head of the National Security Agency, he went up to Congress and testified early on after September 11th, and he said there was a before September 11th, and an after September 11, after September 11, the gloves come off. So we know this, right? And this helps us remember that we should be terrified all the time. When we go to the airport, I did it today, there's security theater, right? You stand in line, you take off your shoes, you take off your belt, you put all your liquids in a baggie that has to be exactly a quart size baggie, no bigger, no smaller. You take your, your laptop out of your backpack. All of this is theater. And its purpose is to remind us that we are in danger and that only the government can protect us. It's as if the government offered us this bargain. Allow us to do whatever we need to do whether it's mass surveillance of internet and email or telephones, or it's torture, or it's the destruction of a fully developed industrialized country like Iraq, any of those things, allow us to do those things and return, in return we promise that we will keep you safe. Well, it's a false bargain. It's as if the government were saying, let us do what we need to do, and we promise that you will never die. And the reality is, I hate to break it to you, but every one of us in this room, <laughs> right, is going to die. The government cannot prevent it. And so, no matter how many people we torture, no matter how much surveillance we have, it will never stop a disaffected young man from putting explosives in a backpack and setting them off at the end of the Boston Marathon. And believe me, having run a few marathons, very slowly, I do not like the idea of people getting blown up in them. I'm not in favor of that. But the reality is that that is part of the insecurity of life, that there are human beings who will hurt other human beings. And when we live in a country where you can get a gun wherever you want, it makes it a whole lot easier. But the truth is the government can't protect us from everything. But the other truth is our chances of actually being victims of a terror attack are minuscule. It was way more dangerous for me to get into the car and drive to the airport today. Especially with me. Well, right, well, yeah. <laughs> We're not gonna talk about Sam's driving. Okay, so let me just say a little bit more about some of the techniques of of torture that the US government has used and a little bit of the history of their development. So the CIA in the 1960s paid for a whole bunch of academic research and most of it was conducted on the East Coast at places like Yale and in Canada at McAllister University. And if you want to read a very good book about this, it's by um, Alfred McCoy and it's called A Question of Torture. And it's a history of that, that research program. But what came out of it for the CIA was a manual that was called the Kubark Manual, K-U-B-A-R-K, which was an acronym the CIA used to refer to itself. It was like a code name for the CIA. And two versions came out, one in 1963, and then 20 years later in 1983. And that was the version that was used to train the Contra, the counter-revolutionaries that the US was secretly and illegally 
arming to fight against the people who had thrown out the dictator of Nicaragua, the Sandinistas, as they were called. And when I lived in the war zones of Nicaragua in 1984, when it was still illegal for the US to be funding this war, I actually found evidence we, of the US involvement in terms of US munitions that were, that were being used to blow up things like granaries. But I also met people who had been kidnapped by the Contra, taken to Honduras, had been tortured there by, by uh, the Contra with US advisors standing by, and had then been sent back into Nicaragua to do the same thing to other Nicaraguans. And this is how torturers are made. They are made first by being put through this ordeal. And if you have survive it, in some cases, you will come out feeling that you have a, a superiority that enables you and gives you the right, in effect, to do this to people who are less than you. So this Kubark manual comes out. And one of the things that they talk about is how important it is to prevent him from building your, your victim from building bridges back to, your own, to his known world. And so that includes controlling the source's environment, manipulating things like time, how often people eat, whether they eat at all, and heat and cold, uh, sensory deprivation, exposure to extremes of heat, of light, unending noise, and many people who have been tortured say of all the things that happened to them, it was having the earphones on their heads and the sound that they could never get away from. Because in a, again, it's a way of destroying your cognitive capacity. And that was the worst. It was worse than the physical torture. So all of this was for the purpose of creating what the CIA called DDD, which stands for debility, dependency, and dread. Then the CIA seems to have had a memory lapse. And they forgot they had paid millions and millions of dollars for this research. And many people believe, including Alfred McCoy, that, for example, um, uh, Stanley Milgram, who did the famous Milgram experiments, was probably funded by the CIA. Um, but they seem to have forgotten because in 2002, they hired two psychologists named Bruce Jessen and James Mitchell. And they paid them $81 million to design an interrogation program. And essentially what they did was sell the CIA back their own research. Only now it was using the gloss of the language of Martin Seligman, who's a famous psychologist, who called it learned helplessness. But essentially the same thing. And these are the two people who invented the waterboarding program and who were the first people to actually put it into practice in Thailand. And the first person that it was done to is a man named Abu Zubaydah, who is still in solitary confinement in Guantanamo to this day. So I just want to say one more thing about actual techniques of torture. And this has to do with something that they call stress and duress, or stress positions. And the thing about a stress position is that what it is, is being in an uncomfortable position, say, shackled all four limbs to a ring in the floor, or strung up so that you can barely, your feet are barely touching the floor, or w spread with your arms back across a bed like this, across a bunk bed, all of which sound like they might be really nice yoga stretches for a minute or two. <laughs> and the truth is, you know, you're here, you're gonna sit here while I'm talking. The difference is, in the time that I'm talking, you are constantly moving just a little bit. A tendon gets tired, a ligament gets tired, a bone gets tired, a muscle gets tired. You just unconsciously shift your weight a little tiny bit. The stress positions can cause as excruciating pain as anything you can do to someone with electric current, but it doesn't leave a mark. And this is the kicker, you're doing it to yourself. And what the CIA discovered is that this is way more effective in breaking a person down than attacking them physically from outside because there is the shame of the fact that you have allowed yourself to, to hurt your own body and that no one is touching you and you are doing it to yourself. So 
these are some of the, the things that we tend to think of as being, you know, torture light, but there's nothing light about it. Okay, so let me just talk a little bit about, let me just give you the definition one more time, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about different ethical approaches to this problem. So institutionalized state torture, intentional infliction of severe mental or physical suffering by an official or agent of some political entity, which results in dismantling the victim's sensory, psychological, and social worlds with the purpose of establishing and maintaining the power of that political entity. So, when I wrote this book, Mainstreaming Torture, I really hoped, even though it was an academic publisher, that I would be able to reach ordinary readers as well as academics. And that's hard because, you know, it's got this whole chapter in it that's about ethics and some technical stuff about ethics. So, first of all, let me tell you, I sometimes get frustrated with my own field because there are two basic divisions of the world of ethics. There's theoretical ethics, and applied ethics. See if you can guess which one has more cachet in the academic world. <laughs> it's theoretical ethics. So once you become interested in applying ethical theory to a particular issue in a serious way and not just as a case of hypotheticals, you are now déclassé. You are now not really quite on the intellectual level of the high theorists. Nonetheless, um, Aristotle said that the purpose of doing ethics, he said about it, we are not inquiring in order to know what virtue is, but in order to become good, since otherwise our inquiry would have been no use. And if you prefer you know, a 19th century philosopher, I'll give you Karl Marx, who said, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And so that's the kind of ethicist I am. So, um, let me say that both the scholarly and the popular discussions of torture in the period since September 11th have made the same mistake. And in the book, in addition to looking what eth at what ethicists say, I also have a content analysis of editorials from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times about torture. And it's very interesting that both the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, they have very different points of view. The Wall Street Journal says, torture? What torture? Well, if it was torture, they deserved it, and whatever it takes to keep us safe. The New York Times says, we should never torture because that's not the kind of country that we are, and it's bad for our reputation in the world, and besides, our soldiers will be in danger if they are captured, and it's known that we can't torture our captives. You know, we don't want that to happen to our soldiers. But in both cases, the newspapers and many of the ethicists treat torture as if it's this episode, as if it's a particular action that you can judge based on its immediate consequences in the case of one theory of ethics, which you will not be surprised to hear is called consequentialism, which says that basically you can tell if an action is good or not, depending on what happens afterwards. Another major theory of ethics is called deontology, which um, is a name that was given to uh, Immanuel Kant's ethics really after after his death, and, but it, it comes, the root is the Greek root, deon, which means duty. So it's an ethics of duty, and it's also an ethics that in Kant's formulation says, among other things, that the person, the creature that is capable of rational thought, and therefore of moral choice, is infinitely valuable. And that therefore, one should never treat that infinitely valuable person as if it were merely an instrument to use for as a means to some other end. People are ends in themselves, they're not tools to get what you want. Or as I explain to my students when we talk about this and I say, so you know, has anybody ever used you? Well yeah, I had a friend who always borrowed money from me, but he never would lend, you know, he never would pay me back and you know, and he would diss me in front of his other friends and um, I say, okay, don't treat your friend like an ATM. And then I say, so where else do people get used? And you know, sooner or later, somebody will say, well, in sexual relationships. And I'll say, right, don't treat your lover like a vibrator. I don't think that's how Immanuel Kant would have put it. But, 
But the problem with, and then we have the utilitarian approach. So most people, most of the time, are utilitarians in the sense that as we go about our daily, um, our daily business, we make ethical choices all the time. And mostly, when we ask ourselves, should I do this or not do this, the question that we're asking is, who's going to be unhappy if I do this? Who's going to be happy if I do this? Let's weigh the unhappiness and the happiness. And sometimes we count our own happiness more than other people's, which is not what John Stuart Mill would have you do, but we do. Um, but there are other forms of consequentialism. And I'm going to argue that nationalism is actually a form of consequentialist ethics. It says that one should act in such a way as to benefit the nation. And the difference, of course, between the nation and the general happiness is that not everybody's American. In fact, we're a minority. So if we act so as to benefit the people of the United States, that's consequentialist, right? But we're only 4%, 6% of the world's population. It's not utilitarian. OK. So both these approaches treat torture as if it were this thing that happens suddenly in a moment of panic because something terrible is about to happen. And in fact, this is so common that there is a famous kind of case that is con always brought up, which is called the ticking time bomb case. Has anybody heard of this? Yeah, OK. So in the ticking time bomb case, you have in front of you a terrorist. And you know with 100% absolute certainty that this person knows where a bomb has been stashed that's going to go off in two hours. The question is, do you torture him in order to get that information from him so that you can save hundreds of thousands of lives? Do you torture one person to save 1,000 or 100,000? So in a utilitarian calculus, the answer would be, of course, because you really can't weigh even the utter pain and misery of one human being against the deaths of 100,000. In a utilitarian calculus, the answer is obvious. The problem is, this doesn't happen. This isn't how torture really happens. First of all, in this particular case, this is the time when a person is most likely to be able to and to withhold information because they know they only have to hold out for a limited amount of time, and then their mission will be accomplished. So that's number one. Number two, you can't torture somebody if you don't know how to do it. Torture is a physical skill. It requires training. It requires practice. It requires infrastructure. It requires a whole chain of command that makes this possible. This is why the CIA had to go hire a couple of guys to teach them again how to do it. And where these people came from, Jessen and Mitchell, was they had been working for the special ops for this the SEER schools, which are survival, evasion, resistance, and escape schools that our special forces go through in which they are basically tortured. And I've met people who went through this training who say, yes, it's exactly right. When you come out of that, you are Superman. You believe that you are a superior human being because you've survived that, that ordeal. And you now know how to do it to other people. And you feel you're entitled to do it because you have this superior capacity now that you've been through this ordeal. And so these people were instructors at these schools, and they reverse engineered what they were teaching people to withstand at the schools and brought it into the CIA. So you can't torture if you don't know what you're doing, and you can't maintain the capacity to do that without keeping your skills sharp. And that sounds pretty awful, but it's actually true. And so one of the arguments that um, a woman named Jean Maria Rigo has made against torture, she says is a consequentialist argument, but it's this. It's that the use of torture, especially by the armed forces, is demoralizing to the, arm, to the armed forces themselves because in their training, unlike in the CIA, they are actually taught to respect things like the Geneva Conventions. And they are taught that they should invoke the Geneva Conventions if they're ever captured. And it creates, um, it essentially creates a break in the usual moral structure of the armed forces and the way that they think of themselves and the way they actually try to behave. 
so that you'll find, for example, between the armed military and the Donald Rumsfeld Pentagon, there was a lot of conflict about interrogation because what Rumsfeld wanted them to do was what they had been taught at West Point they weren't supposed to do. Okay, so what ethical approach do I think would work for talking about torture? And my answer is let's go all the way back <coughs> to Aristotle. Let's go back to virtue ethics. And virtue ethics is less a method of ethics that tells you in this particular situation, right now, what should I do? Instead, it asks, what kind of moral habits should I develop as a human being so that when I get into a situation where I have to make an ethical choice, I will be able to make the right choice? And so for him, he's interested in qualities like courage, generosity. He has a whole list. One of them is being entertaining at dinner parties. He has a whole list of, of virtues that were appropriate to his time and place. But you know, among them is courage. And I think that, in fact, most of the time, this really fits with my own personal experience on a phenomenological level, that most of the time, we make our moral decisions and we figure out why afterwards. We come up, you know, most of the time we don't have time to say, well, am I going to be using someone as a means to an end rather than an end? Or is this action going to lead to the greatest happiness for the greatest number? We act, and then we figure out why afterwards. And if that's really true, then I want to have good habits because I'm going to be relying on my habits. So there's a modern philosopher named Alastair McIntyre who in 1984 wrote a book called After Virtue. And a lot of what that book is is an indictment of the Enlightenment and liberalism. And I won't go into all of that, but because that's really inside baseball. But what he says is, you know, we need to think about our lives as part of an ongoing story. That as human beings, we are storytelling animals. And that our own lives are narratives. They're stories. And they are, in effect, stories of a quest or a search. And what we're searching for is figuring out what is the good life. What sort of life is a good life for a person like me? And he says, in that context, we develop practices. We are brought into practices. And a practice is a complex collaborative, collaborative activity. So it's something, for example, the example he gives is chopping carrots is an activity. Great cooking is a practice. And especially restaurant cooking, where you are working with a whole group of people together. And that what he says is it's in the context of developing these practices, these complex collaborations with other people, that we develop the habits that will sustain us both in those practices and in this larger quest for understanding what our lives are about. So if we think about torture as a practice, it's not a positive thing, he would argue. And he argues that practices are good uniformly. So maybe let's call it a false practice. But it's complicated. It involves a lot of people. It's not something people do as individuals. It's something you do as part of a whole structure. It has its own internal values. And so, for example, it has its own version of courage. And this version of courage is that capacity to be able to withstand somebody else's suffering. And if any of you have ever seen someone you care about, or even just a stranger, suffering and not being able to do anything about it, you know that it takes courage to do this. And this is a kind of courage that people in the medical profession, for example, have to have. Because sometimes you have to cause someone pain in order to do what needs to be done. Um, but that kind of courage gets perverted or twisted so that that same capacity to withstand our mirror neurons going off and telling us, bing, 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 somebody is hurting, that hurts me, we instead develop the capacity not to be affected by other people's pain. Similarly, I would argue that the other three classical virtues, which are courage, wisdom, temperance, or moderation, and justice, 
that they are all in their own way twisted in the context of this practice. And the one other that I'll mention is my favorite virtue of all the virtues, which is practical wisdom. And St. Thomas Aquinas calls this right reason about things to be done. And what it is is it's a virtue or an excellence of the mind, of the intellect, but it requires experience. And it's that capacity to think about the meaning of your actions, to think about the moral meaning of your actions in an intelligent way, and to therefore make good decisions about what you are going to do. Aristotle calls it phronesis, and he says it's not something you have as a young person necessarily because it requires experience. Um, I love this virtue, and I think that all of us in the United States, actually, who accept torture as the price of our security, have had that capacity to think perverted a little bit. And so Hannah Arendt, writing about Germany, says that when she interviewed people in Germany about, you know, um, she had left uh, Germany because she was a Jew and she managed to escape and eventually came to the US during World War II. But when she interviewed people about the rise of Hitler and the Holocaust and when she met people like um, Eichmann and other functionaries of the, of the Nazis, she said what they all had in common was it wasn't stupidity, but it was a curious inability to think. And she meant think in a very specific and pretty Kantian way to think about the actual implications of the actions that they were doing, to think about what it meant that they were, that Eichmann, for example, was processing the paper that allowed millions of people to be shipped to the death camps. He didn't kill anybody. He went home and was a good family man, but nonetheless, he lost the ability to think about the meaning of his actions. And I think we have been encouraged as a population to do the same thing, to turn away. And you know, sometimes I call it culpable ignorance. You don't have to know if you don't want to know. But it was November 5th, 2001, that the first article came out in Newsweek by a, a historian and liberal columnist named Jonathan Alter. And the title was, Time to Think About Torture. And the people he wanted to torture were not people we had picked up outside of the US. They were the 600 Muslims who had been rounded up in the US and taken to a special maximum security prison in Brooklyn who were held without access to counsel, incommunicado for six months and tortured. Beaten, exposed to uh, extreme the cold of February while wearing nothing but a hospital gown and in at least one case raped with a police flashlight he wanted to torture them because he thought that would jumpstart the investigation into the worst, what he called the worst crime in American history. I don't know. I might call the extermination of the native peoples or maybe the enslavement of Africans the worst crime in American history, but whatever. Um, he was scared. And he thought that this changes everything. So it's a failure of practical wisdom to believe that one attack changes everything we know about what's right and what's wrong. OK, my time is almost up, so I'm going to very quickly jump to my third theme. And this is going to be some hard stuff. But let me just say that every regime that decides that it's going to torture makes a distinction between people who are legitimate targets of torture and people who must not be tortured because they are human beings. And so, for example, in Chile, the torturers used to speak of the Marxists that they had picked up as humanoid instead of human beings because the idea was that they were really only semi-human. Similarly, in other places, people who are going to be tortured are called rats or vermin or bacteria or viruses. In Brazil in the 1960s under the junta, under US training, the police of Brazil would literally go out on the streets at night and scoop up children who lived on the streets and adults who lived on the streets and bring them in and use them as instructional dummies to torture in front of police cadets so that they could learn the techniques. 
people who are legitimate targets are not human in the same way that we are, whoever we is. In the history of the United States, there are a couple of groups of people, more than, more than two, but I'll just name two, who have historically, throughout US history, been treated as not entirely human. The first group are the native people who were living here when the Europeans came. And the sep second group are the Africans who were enslaved and brought to the United States, or what wasn't even yet the United States. And here's the thing. Torture and slavery are absolutely connected at the very root because when the farmers, and there's a great book by Edmund Morgan called American Slavery, American Freedom, and it's about, he takes the, the case of Virginia as an example. And he talks about Virginia. And so originally when they began tobacco farming, that's a very labor intensive kind of farming and they had a labor shortage. So they were bringing over people from London and some of them came voluntarily in return for passage on a boat. They would work a certain number of years. Some of them had actually been picked up on the street because they were <coughs> vagrants and were shipped over against their will. But all of them got this deal. Work for this farmer for seven years and at the end of that time, you will get your own piece of land and you will be able to farm yourself. When they brought the people from Africa, those people weren't going to get the same deal. They weren't going to work seven years and then be released and get a farm. They were going to work their entire lives, and so were their children and their children's children. And what the farmers very quickly figured out was the only way they could make people work was by making their bodies hurt, by the threat of pain and the actual use of pain. And so the shackles, the whipping, the, um, the different kinds of mutilations of the body, all of this was absolutely central to the economic success of slavery. We see this even further, and there's an incredible book called The Half Has Never Been Told, which is about how slavery essentially developed the capital that was necessary not only to build the southern United States, but also to build um, the industrial north by the production of cheap cotton. And he talks, in this book, you will discover the way that torture was used to vastly increase, like by 10 times, the amount of work that a single person could do in a day. So over the decades, they went from a single person being able to pick a certain number of bales in a day of cotton to 10 times that much 30 years later. And the method they use, and they wrote about it, they explained it very clearly, had to do with the beatings that they gave people who did not miss their tar who did not meet their targets. And this happened every single night at the end of the day. Whoever had done the least would be would be whipped in in a way that, you know, I'm not going to describe it, but it, this was this was a debilitating experience. And so people knew. And they discovered that they could work extremely fast. And they developed a whole manual technology of farming that was only ended when machines came in that were capable of doing it. So we have the Civil War. We have the end of slavery. We have the end of Reconstruction. Now we've got a new form of slavery called slavery. And there's a book about it called Slavery by Another Name, which is the use of convicts who've been arrested often for very minor offenses and have been rented out by state governments very often to the very same people that they had worked for when they were enslaved. This went on until the 1940s. The use, the leasing of convicts as if they were a photocopier, you know. And again, physical, physical discipline, physical pain. These people dug the coal out of the mines that made Birmingham, Alabama the steel town that it became. They are the ones who built up the industrial strength of the South after the war. Then we come forward to lynching. Lynching is absolutely a form of institutionalized state torture. And I say this because the state approved of it. The state, very often the people who did the lynching were people who worked for the police in their, in their work lives. 
and it was an intentional attempt to create terror and to prevent, you know, to enforce the power of the regime, Jim Crow, white supremacy, and it worked. And it was socially embedded. People, literally white people, came out to watch lynchings and brought picnic baskets. They took photographs. They took the photographs into town and they had them made up into postcards, which they sent around to their friends. Look at the fun that we had on Saturday afternoon. There, you can see these. They're available. There are people who have collected them, and you can see them on the internet. It was a whole genre of tourist photography. Now we have mass incarceration. And there is absolutely no question that US prisons today are the place where torture is most, most visible, most in plain sight. And I'm just going to mention two forms. There are beatings. There are exposures to extremes of heat and cold. There is forced labor. There are all of those things. But I just want to mention two other things, rape and solitary confinement. So rape is a form of torture that's used all over the world. And Amnesty International and other organizations have done studies of rape in US prisons. And it's very clear, again, that it is used as a tool of control to control the populations of the prisons. Usually in men's prisons, it's other inmates who do the raping, but it is controlled and maneuvered by the guards. In women's prisons, it's usually corrections officers who are responsible for the rape. But in both cases, it's not part of the sentence, but it's so embedded in our consciousness as normal that it's an ordinary plot point in something like Law and Order SVU, right? Who here has ever seen Law and Order SVU? All right, so here's the plot. A bad man does a bad thing. They catch him. They put him in the interrogation room. He wants a lawyer, because God forbid you should want a lawyer when the police are talking to you. Well, Elliot Stabler says to him, you know, we could get you a lawyer, but then we're going to have to send you to Rikers overnight, you know, until we can find one. And pretty boy like you, I don't want to think about what's going to happen to you at Rikers. And people laugh because it's a laugh line, and yet it's the truth about what goes on every day in prisons. And it is also the truth that the people who are in the US prisons are vastly disproportionately African American and Latino. And so once again, what we have is a group of people who by their race are legitimate targets of a particular kind of treatment that if you look at it with wise eyes, you might call torture. And the other is solitary confinement. Solitary confinement, we now understand can, within a period of two weeks, cause complete psychosis. Earlier this year, a man was released from um, the most notorious Louisiana prison, which is called Angola, because that's where the people, the black people who first came to that part of Louisiana came from. And this prison, um, there was a man who had been in solitary confinement without contact with other human beings for four decades, 40 years. He finally was released this year. And you know, you see him speak, and it's just, it's a miracle that he can talk at all. In California at Pelican Bay, until very recently, there were people who had been in solitary for 20 years, one for 30 years. We've, there was a court case which we won recently. And in fact, at Pelican Bay, the number of people in solitary confinement has been drastically reduced. And this is really important because, as Aristotle notes, we are social animals. And without human contact, we become crazy very quickly. This needs to stop. So to sum up, I've laid out a bunch of things that you can't now unknow. I mean, you can choose not to believe me, but <laughs> you can't unknow them. And so the question is, what do I do now, now that I know these things? And the answer is, one way or another, you get organized. It could be Black Lives Matter. It could be the Iraq vets against the war. It could be Veterans for Peace. It could be military families speak out. Yes, it could be United for Peace and Justice. It could be any of a number of organizations. You get out there, 
you learn the skills of working with other people in an organized way because that's the only thing that's going to turn this around. And um, I'll just tell one little story at the very tail end, which is about my friend Sharon Martinez. So back in the 90s, before there was an internet, before there were smartphones, we had answering machines for our telephones. And <laughs> yes, I know, I, I told you I was old, right? So, um, so Sharon was connected with an organization called the um, People, uh, the Committee in, in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, or CISPIS. And she would get information about people that we knew, union organizers or other people who had been arrested. And very often we would know exactly where they had been sent. And she would leave on her answering machine all the information for this week's arrestees. And then we could call in and get that information off the answering machine. And she had the phone numbers. And her numbers were really good. You could actually call the warden of the prison at Ilopango Air Force Base in El Salvador, and he would pick up the phone. And I know this because I've done it. And so if you spoke Spanish, you could call from the United States and say, you know, we know you have this woman, Gloria Garcia. We know that she was picked up on such and such a day. She was seen entering the prison. She needs to be released now and unharmed because we know she's there and we're going to complain to our State Department, which is what funds you. And, you know, they would say, oh, no, no, we don't have her. I don't know what you're talking about. And, you know, but people would get released. So a couple years later, I was at a meeting of the women's building in, at the women's building in San Francisco to hear some trade unionists coming who had come up from El Salvador to talk about the situation there. And this would have been in about 1989 or 1990. And um, this woman gets up to speak. And she says, my name is Gloria. Y antes de todo, before anything else, I want to thank the North American solidarity because when I was in prison in the Ilopango Air Force Base being tortured and raped, it was the phone calls that were made from the United States that set me free. And I got chills up and down my back because I suddenly realized I had made some of those phone calls. And it actually made a difference. But it made a difference because Sharon organized us. So that's the story I want to leave you with. I'm happy to entertain questions. Thank you. OK, well, throughout history, there's no question that it's pervasive. And you know, the Romans and the Greeks did terrible things. Interestingly, the Greeks believed only slaves should be tortured. And the reason why was that they falsely believed that it was impossible to lie under torture. And they thought that a free human being should never be forced to say something he didn't want to say. So only slaves. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So, um, so we know it goes way back. I will also say that different societies interpret the exposure to extreme physical pain differently. So there are initiation rituals that you know, some people go through where, yes, it's very painful, but people do that as part of the society. It's not punishment. It's not an attempt to um, establish the power of a government or something like that. So yeah, it exists throughout history. I will say that in the modern period, since really since the establishment of concepts of you know, liberal enlightenment concepts of human equality, of the value of the individual, um, torture is much less permissible. And so this is why earlier regimes never made any, had no pretense about it. They just said, yeah, of course this is what we do. Modern regimes, you know, in the 20th, 21st century, have to pretend it's not happening. Either you've misunderstood and this isn't really torture, or um, you've misunderstood and um, we're only doing it this one exceptional time, or, um, you know, well, what are you, some kind of a Marxist, or whatever, but 
But there's this rhetoric of denial that says, you know, we would never do that. So for example, George W. Bush says, um, he says, you know, this is not how Americans behave. Americans do not torture people, therefore we couldn't have tortured anybody. <laughs> and there's this, there's this need to deny. So in an odd way, I think that's an advance. The fact that people at least, and this is really the sad thing, in the United States there was a national consensus. Despite what the US had done in other countries, despite the fact that the US employed torture in the Phoenix program in a massive way in Vietnam, and despite the fact that we were training other countries in torture techniques, nonetheless, among the ordinary population of the US, there was a consensus that torture is wrong. We don't do that. And that's what changed after September 11th. So I'm not going to say that's a regression to human nature. I'm going to say that it is as much in human nature to do harm to other beings as it is to go do good things to other beings. But that, that ethics, honestly, that capacity for making moral choice is what makes it possible for us to stop doing that. And you don't have to have a degree in it to be able to stop. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm not going to say that, yeah. Ah, OK. So the 9-11 Commission report, the official report of the, of the, that the congressional investigation into 9-11 and the events of 9-11, here's what I think. I think that they probably obscured the did their best to in obscure the involvement of Saudi nationals. Um, you know, the Saudi Arabia. We are in the middle of a war in which we are literally fighting in Yemen against, we are fighting on the side of Al Qaeda with Saudi Arabia against a um, basically tribal Shia insurgency in that country. So our connection with Saudi Arabia makes very little sense. I mean, it makes economic sense, or did at one time, but on, a, on an ethical level makes no sense. Um, do I think, you know, oftentimes when I talk, I'll, people who are part of like engineers for 9-11 um, Truth and other organizations will come and give me their very beautifully produced material about how those airplanes couldn't possibly have brought down the, um, the towers what I say about that is, I don't know. I think they did. But what I do know is, regardless of who was you know, responsible, and I honestly think it was the airplanes that flew into the towers, regardless of that, the Bush administration that day was prepared to take advantage of it and to put into place a plan that they had entered the White House with all along, which was the plan to take Saddam Hussein out of power in Iraq. And the reason we know this is they wrote about it in public in the 1990s, right? They published it, the, the Project for a New American Century. They, they tried to sell it to Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton said, no, thank you. So the same people, Paul Wolfowitz and Dick Cheney, they come into the White House with this plan, and this gives them the perfect opportunity. And the torture, the very first torture, the first waterboarding was done to Abu Zubaydah in Thailand for the purpose of getting him to say that there was a connection between Al Qaeda and Saddam Hussein, which there was not. And similarly, when they brought in these special techniques in Guantanamo under Donald Rumsfeld, and he signed off on a list of 10 of them, the reason why was that he was putting pressure on them to get somebody that they had captured somewhere to say that there was a link between Al Qaeda and Saddam Hussein so that they could sell to the American people that we needed to attack Iraq because of 9-11. Now, what's really interesting to me is, and I was saying this to Sam earlier, the 9-11 attackers have become sort of a Rorschach. So every few years, I will ask my students, my undergrads, what was the nationality of most of the people who attacked the United States, who flew the planes on September 11th? 
And so during the Iraq war, when I had student, you know, students who had family fighting over there, people were convinced that those were Iraqis, for sure. <laughs> Everyone knows Iraq attacked us. And then a few years later, after the war had been going for a while and we were beginning to hear rumblings about how we really needed, you know, what did they say, um, the, the cis, everyone wants to go to Baghdad, real men want to go to Tehran. And we were beginning to hear the ginning up of a war against Iran, and I asked the same thing, and people were sure that the people who flew the plane were from Iran. <laughs> and the truth is that, that that has become sort of the board against which we can throw you know, the enemy du jour, and, um, and people will believe it and believe that by fighting that enemy, we are still avenging September 11th. I mean, Muammar Gaddafi would not have wanted to live in Libya under Muammar Gaddafi, but he had nothing to do with September 11th. He had nothing to do with a global war on terrorism. And by the way, a war on an emotion, you know, makes metaphorical sense maybe, but not actual sense. I'm actually reviewing an article right now for publication by someone who wants to, t to apply just war theory to the war on drugs. <laughs> and my argument is, well, you know, drugs aren't actually an enemy you can fight in a war. <laughs> so there, there, there's some confusion here. But OK, so I don't know if I answered your question. So yeah, so there was a lot of propaganda, um, clearly that convinced us that we needed to go to war um, the first time around in the, the first Gulf War. And you know, there, were, there were complex things going on, such as Iraq being a landlocked country and not being able to get access to their only port, which basically they needed Kuwaiti agreement to get access to. And it's true that there was all kinds of, you know, the most gross, prop the, my favorite of the propaganda lies was that the Iraqis came into Kuwaiti hospitals and ripped babies out of their incubators so that they could ship the incubators back to Baghdad. Well, first of all, they had incubators in Baghdad. And secondly, it never happened. But this was, you know, and it reminds me of World War I propaganda of, you know, what the British were told about the Huns raping Belgian nuns. It was that quality. So yeah, we were maneuvered into that war. And I, I was it, I don't know who it was. Yeah, right, right, exactly, yeah. And you know, so yeah, there are people who do this for a living. Oh, sure, so, so McIntyre has a lot of examples of what he calls a practice. He's got a little bit of a fixation with uh, fishing cooperatives in rural areas that I think is a little romantic. But, um, you know, I, I mean, having known people in the fishing business, you know, is, is not all that great. But really, he's talking about anything. It could be, for example, professional American-style football which is complex, it's collaborative, it requires all kinds of intelligence, all kinds of physical courage, and various other kinds of capacities for teamwork, for generosity. Um, an example I use in my book, oddly enough, is knitting. Now, you might think knitting is something you do by yourself. But the truth is that knitting is deeply collaborative because we share patterns from generation to generation and across the world. And we also carefully and honestly critique our own and other people's work. We have standards of excellence. And we know when, you have, you know, when our work has not risen to those standards. I'm actually part of a social network of six million people who do fiber arts around the world. And if you do fiber arts and you're not on Ravelry, you should be. Um, but <laughs> but it, is, it is an ongoing and historic connection across many generations of what looks very simple. Knitting is basically pulling one loop through loop, another loop. But when you add it up, it can become extremely complex, both in the product and also in the activity. So writing knitting patterns, I was saying this earlier, is a lot like writing computer code. They have loops in them. They have continue until. They have a lot of the things that you now find in your standard average computer program. So knitters very often are people who've also worked in the tech, tech world. So yeah, 
There are lots of examples of complex practices. Chess is another example. Um, you know, difficult games are a good example. Well, no, not yet, there, there's, but I'll tell you what's happened as a result of the work of groups like Black Lives Matter. And you know, in 2010, Michelle Alexander published The New Jim Crow, which is a book that describes the way that mass incarceration has been used to disenfranchise, especially people of African descent. So one of the ways that happens literally is in many states, if you've been convicted of a felony, even if you have been released, you're no longer on parole, you still can't vote. So it varies state to state. But so she wrote this book in 2010. And a lot of people read it, but it didn't get traction. And this is one of the mysteries of the world. You can work away for years and years on something that you, you know, that's really important, and then all of a sudden, for some reason, it will catch the public attention. And that's what's happened with mass incarceration in the last year of President Obama's presidency. And so one of the things we see him doing is commuting sentences. I wish he would commute Leonard Peltier's sentence, but um, you know, he is commuting sentences for people, nonviolent drug offenders, and there is beginning to be talk. So I have a feeling that we are at the tip of something. Hillary Clinton, actually, in one of, the, in one of her um, debates in, her se in the second debate, use the language systemic racism. I mean, people have been working for decades to get across the idea that racism is institutionalized in various ways in this country and just brick wall, brick wall, brick wall, and then all of a sudden we have the major, a major candidate for president saying that language. So sometimes I say that political activism or social justice work is like surfing. So you paddle out, you paddle out, and I've never surfed, but it's, I've body surfed. I've done a lot of body surfing, okay, but I've never actually stood up on the board. But, you know, so you get out there, you go through, you get out to where the waves are, and then you wait, and you wait, and you wait, until that wave comes. And when that wave comes, you need to be ready to use all the skills and all the practicing that you've done through you know, however many years of work to be able to grab that wave and ride it. Because you really don't know when someone like Alicia Garza and her two friends get together and start Black Lives Matter, when something like that is going to seize the public imagination. And you have to be ready. All right, thank you guys. Thank you for coming. <laughs>